Hi, my name is Zoe Blade and this is my first uh, Patreon sponsored Q&A. Hello, yes, yes, thank you for having me on, yes. I shall read out these questions for you that I've prepared. Okay, let's have a look. First question. Gordon Davies asks, how did you originally get into synthesized music? Oh, that's a good one, isn't it? So I've got a terrible memory and I'm not clear on how or why this happened. I just know that when I was 16, which would have been 1997 because I'm quite old, uh, is uh, that's when I first got a program called Scream Tracker 3, which is something you use to make music in DOS, which was like the precursor to Windows. Um, and it's a kind of interesting uh, way of sharing music with uh, tracker software like that because when you gave someone the song you made, you inherently gave them the kind of source files for it. You gave them the notation and the samples, and it was all based on samples. Uh, it's very much like having a Fairlight CMI for free, and anyone who has a computer could use it. So having this kind of free musical instrument like The Art of Noise and Funky Goes to Hollywood used, not that I'd heard of them at the time, but having access to that kind of thing, um, you know, how could I not? It was great. Um, the first few, uh, I think few dozen or so songs I wrote were just with my voice. I just sample like single syllables and then build up uh, songs around that. Then after a while, I think I got bored of that. So I got some drumsticks and I think I hit a pillow and that was a kick drum. And I hit the wardrobe door and that was a snare drum and just built up uh, samples using household objects like that, using a, uh, a three pound microphone from Maplin, which is, uh, it, it was not a, a luxurious setup. It was kind of very kind of bare bones, but it was great fun to do. And I wrote hundreds of tracks in um, kind of a, like a sequel to that program by this Australian guy called Jeffrey Lim, uh, Impulse Tracker. And so my friend Alex and I, my, my you know, best friend at the time, we, we spend a lot of time together just making these songs together and, and sharing songs that we've made to play for each other. And uh, we kind of spent quite a, a lot of our teenage years, I think, both of us making music that way. And it took a while before any of it was good and I should have learned some basic music theory sooner. But just through sheer practice, you know, we, we kind of made some interesting music. I think some of which ended up in Deep Cuts, this album of like my, my earlier stuff. Uh, as far as the actual synthesis goes, uh, a while later I got uh, a second-hand Roland SH-101, which is this really nice monosynth. I think it's the, the only one I regretted selling in, until I, I got the modular. And I had that second-hand from a shop for I think it was £180. It's ridiculously like good value in, in those days. Um, and what I would do is I would, it wasn't even in tune or anything and at the time I didn't know you know how to fix that so um, what I would do is I just uh, play a, a single note or a single weird bleepy sound and then I'd sample it in uh, into impulse tracker and I build songs up that way uh, if you listen to I think the track dot matrix dominatrix for instance it is uh, a bunch of 909 sounds from an Ovation drum station I eventually got and it's one sound with pulse width modulation from the SH-101 and it's brought up a whole uh, piece of music with, with nothing but those and it's actually kind of fun it's kind of similar to how in some ways um, let's see there's there's that track of Flat Beats by uh, Mr. Ezo that was done with uh, an MS-20 and a sampler and a sequencer and it's basically the same kind of setup as that it's a really nice way to to make music if you want to give yourself a, a few constraints to work within i kind of recommend that but yeah it, it's filled with hexadecimal and things in uh, trackers so doors these days we, we have it quite good and you, you probably want to do it in ableton live or something instead okay next question case fisher asks I would love to hear about how you use the modular for sound design versus composition and building songs. You get into it in some of your old videos, but it'd be great to get a brief update for your modern setup. How much do you still compose and use and arrange and such in a door? So for a few years now, I've been using uh, Propeller Head Reason, and that's still what I compose in, even though I make the sounds in what's behind me now. So when it comes to composing a track, uh, I will uh, see, use a subtractor and uh, the re-drum, re -drum. I use those things to, <laughs> that's what it's called, I use those to actually compose uh, the songs in as a kind of chip tune, 
And if there's lyrics, I just like make a note, you know, this this is where the stress and uns unstressed syllables will go and I'll make a note later. I'm going to text file, okay, then there's where the lyrics going to go. Uh, if there's anything like, say, orchestral samples or mellotron or orchestron, anything like that, the, the kind of digital samples used for polyphony, any of those I will export as WAV files. And the actual remaining notation, all the parts that I'm going to play on the synth, I'll export that as MIDI data. Uh, put it on an SD card, come ac across the uh, the hallway into this room here and this is my studio where I'll perform all of the parts on the uh, Dupfer A100 you see behind me and that way, um, first of all it means uh, any kind of, you kind of a bad melody, any kind of badness in the melody you'll be able to hear when it's in chiptune form, it won't be hiding behind any fancy timbres, there's no effort to hide it, if it sounds good then you know it actually is a, a strong melody, so then by the time I'm working on the, the actual um, timbre side of it, the sounds, I know it's already a solid melody that I'm building upon, so I, I've got a pretty solid foundation to improve upon and I also get to concentrate completely on the sound design at that bit. So by segregating the workflow like that, you, you get to kind of, you know, uh, in each step of the process, concentrate on that one part and just, you know, really kind of give it your all for that particular component. Um, having said that, it's good to not have any reverence for what you've done. I mean, you can still decide once you're recording, actually I probably should go back and change the composition a bit, maybe add a, a few flourishes here and there, or you could be uh, mixing it down afterwards and think actually I should do some kind of glitchy editing I, I didn't do originally so I, I'll go and do that now and not care too much about you know upsetting the people who made the original you have to kind of I know it's the same person but when you're wearing the different hats um, you kind of have to pretend that you don't know how much effort you put into the original stuff when you're then editing it so you can ditch what's bad and, and redo what's necessary and, and just add new things to make it your own so at every stage I'm trying to kind of uh, imprint a unique style onto it uh, in that kind of capacity. So when I'm editing, I'll try and edit with a little bit of flair sometimes. And when I'm you know recording, make sure it's got these you know weird little sounds and things. So yeah, that's generally how I work. Is in the office with my partner. It's a really nice atmosphere. That's where I compose, and then I come into this little studio to record on with the uh, the, the the wacky setup. <laughs> Clara Sparks asks, what are the lyrics to On the Fritz? They're not captioned in the end credits of violence and I don't see them on your website. Uh, yeah, I need to go back and check the lyric On the Fritz to make sure before I upload it to the lyric page. But off the top of my head, um, if your democracy is going On the Fritz, what will you choose to do? Resist them or submit? And I was unwarrantedly proud of myself for sneaking the word Fritz in there because of the name of, of Natalie's character. Um, yeah, so that's the lyric to Under Fritz. Berthon Videopathy asks, who are some of your favorite film composers? Okay, let, let's have a look and, and see what's on my Walkman. I'm, I'm in the, the 21st century with a, a Walkman by Sony. May have, may have heard of these, they're wonderful devices. I thought it was all about the iPod. <laughs> Where do I put the tape in? Uh, Wendy Carlos, obviously, um, has a very kind of otherworldly sound and using the, the Moog and recording Tempax tape and all of that kind of weirdness very much has rubbed off on me. Uh, I only kind of wish I put in the amount of effort she did. If you ever read up on how she did things, it is amazing the amount of effort she put into like, every single note. There should be layers and layers. It is really ridiculous. Um, you know, she, she's very good. I recommend uh, the Clockwork Orange soundtrack. Here, here's a good one uh, if you want something a bit more obscure. Uh, Paul Leonard Morgan, who did the soundtracks to Dread and Limitless. Those are, are two very good ones. Uh, something with uh, a bit more bite to it. Uh, Clint Mansell's Goods, although it's hard for me to say how much it's because I like the music and how much it's because I like the films, but I like Pop Elite itself, so it's probably a bit of both. Uh, I see Nina's approving of that last one, that's good. <laughs> Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, that's, uh, I think that's probably a, a given. <laughs> if you listen to my stuff, it's like, oh yeah, I can, I can see you like that, yeah. Oddly enough, not much Tangerine Dream, which you'd think given the instruments I use, but I'm actually not that influenced by them, at least I don't think I am. But I mean, you know, they're, they're nice enough. I like them, especially in that um, Black Mirror episode. Vangelis, Vangelis is uh, 
very good in, in not just uh, Blade Runner, but uh, Cosmos for Carl Sagan. That's got some good Vangelis music in it. Off the shelf tracks, but, but very good ones. Oh, here yeah, I've been listening to the Akira soundtrack lately. That's that's uh, quite a ride. As is Paprika. Fun facts, the Paprika soundtrack, because it's Japanese, is alphabetically the first uh, thing in our entire music collection. So when you start the car, it just starts off with this. Ba, ba, da, ba, 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 ba. It is great fun. Apparently, you know, Nina, who knows how to drive and I don't, she's not so much a fan for some reason. Apparently it's distracting. I don't know what that's about. Uh, it's not distracting. It just makes me laugh every time I turn the ignition. Ah, so you are a fan. <laughs> Uh, Hans Zimmer, of course, but that's another obvious one. I absolutely love an Inception, the blend of orchestral sounds and synthesizer sounds. That's something I'm trying to get into a lot recently. Uh, same in Junkie XL, they're, they're good too. And I only just realised so recently that the uh, the rapper in Junkie XL is the same one as in Urban Dance Squad, because I think we all like the film Hackers, so that was, that was quite an exciting find for me. So, yeah, that, that's... Uh, some composers I like. Nina, do you have any composers you like? Um, a couple of the ones I was going to suggest. I was going to suggest the Clint Mansell. I noticed a thumbs up when you uh, told me I said Clint Mansell. You're like, yes, Clint Mansell, that's good. Yeah, the thing I don't get, Nina, is you and I'm guessing quite a few other Nine Inch Nails fans. You like Nine Inch Nails. Um, you, you like quite a bit of um, Clint Mansell, but you don't listen to the Pop Elite Itself uh, album that Trent Reznor uh, produced, which seems crazy to me. It's like a, you've got an extra almost Nine Inch Nails album. I cannot convince I cannot convince Nine Inch Nails fans to listen to that. But there's this album, Dos Dedos Mi Amigos. It's a Pop Elite Itself album. It's produced by Trent Reznor, and it sounds very Trent Reznor-y. You know, it really shows. But I can't convince them. Maggie's Daddy asks, I was wondering who or what are or have been some major influences to impact your music, e.g. video game scores, mainstream or underground music, art styles or eras, authors, films, creators, and so on and so on. It's a very broad question if you ask me. Who are my influences? I wrote a list. Okay. <laughs> I prepared for this one. Okay. Uh, one of my uh, kind of earliest kind of memories of, of like liking music was this tape I had. This is going back a bit, uh, an audio tape of Amiga mods, and that might have been how I heard about tracking as a thing. And it had a whole bunch of demo scene Amiga music, and I listened to that quite a lot. I think it, it, a lot of the, the tunes are still you know very much in my mind, and I've recently kind of you know bought it again on on CD. And they're very nice tunes, quite a few of them, and I listen to them quite a lot. And the thing about the Amiga is, much like uh, the early Beatles work and early mixing desks where they were gated, there was no kind of left-right panning knob, it was either left or right or centre, nothing in between. Uh, yeah, the, the Amiga mods had four channels of sound, two on the left and two on the right. So everything I listened to on the Amiga, on the headphones, is basically it's like it's trying to make you schizophrenic it's just playing completely different music in both ears and i'm fine with that so that's influenced me far too much uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll show a new piece i'm working on to nina and she'll be like ah oh, you're using your amiga stereo panning again you should probably not do that so i'm trying to be less influenced by that tape these days but it's it's nice all the old demo scene music it's pretty obvious that craft work have influenced me in particular uh, this is kind of a, a, a more kind of weird thing I picked up on. Uh, on the album Computer World, which is my favourite Kraftwerk album, uh, I've got the CD remaster and you can hear um, there's a bit in it where the master tape kind of glitches and it kind of, I think it drops out from one ear for a bit. That's, it, as stupid as it sounds, that influenced me. Not just Kraftwerk as like pioneering kind of synth pop electronic music, but the fact that there's kind of this old artifact which has kind of aged, I think that kind of gives it an extra layer. Because originally Kraftwerk were about looking to this, this bold, bright future, but if you listen to them now, it's a nostalgic look at the past of how we used to imagine the future. So it's very much retro-futurism. And although that's not originally what they were about, if you're listening to them now, that's probably why. And this whole kind of idea of, you know, the future isn't what it used to be, uh, is very much something that influences me. This whole idea of, of yesterday's tomorrow today, that, that's like the, the slogan of my record label. So uh, yeah, that, that very much has influenced me. 
Uh, Aphex Twin is another one. I've written far too much about him online and obsessed over him, well, over his music far too much for you know for years. I think um, I really like how uh, he would think um, in a very lateral manner. Uh, a lot of what he did, it wasn't necessarily about the music so much as the sounds and making and finding weird quirky sounds. So I think that kind of aesthetic has rubbed off for me a lot. I mean, there's so much you can do sound-wise. It's a shame if everyone's doing the same thing. So, you know, making your own drum kit sounds, things like that, that's rubbed off for me quite a bit. BT, Brian Transio, is a, a good one. He combines all the kind of the, the fun, quirky, glitchy aesthetic with pop tune sensibilities. And I think not enough people uh, are doing that combination, uh, especially his album, These Hopeful Machines. is like this perfect blend of this kind of challenging aspect and also this kind of catchy, comfortable aspect. And I think the two together work so well. I really think, you know, that that should be much more of a popular thing. I think we've covered uh, Wendy Carlos in a previous question, but yeah, if only I could get up to the standard of her work ethic, but her other real sense of this otherworldly kind of music, I like to think I'm kind of striving towards that and, and somewhat accomplishing that much. Pete Namnock's another good one that might be a bit more obscure. He made kind of ambient techno, ambient house music. Uh, kind of less Brian Eno and more kind of selected ambient works, 85 to 92, that kind of sound. Um, he's worked with pretty much everyone who makes that sort of music and he was ridiculously prolific. He owned the record label, uh, he would release I think only 500 copies of each album because that's like the smallest one you could do, but he made something ridiculous like an album a week. So uh, yeah, I, I'm always trying to get a bit closer to this kind of idea of just if you make lots and lots, then you know, you're, you're actually going to practice a lot and you're going to make a lot of, of good things that way. So yeah, that that's someone more from a kind of business side. I think Pete Namuk is uh, a good influence. Also, I like the homogenized artwork. That's nice. It is it's really. Uh, encouraging the collector's mentality which i always fall for xenomania uh probably one of my loftier ambitions they're the people who make a lot of pop music like you won't have heard of them but you would have heard of a lot of the groups that they make music for and it's just a bunch of people making really catchy music and being very good at their jobs so Certainly with things like, I think, uh, that Doggy Dogs album, Blast Off, I was very much consciously trying to make the catchiest, talkiest music possible, and I really need to get back into that again. Because, uh, to my mind, that worked quite well, especially when you combine it with the quirkier sounds. The, the catchy pop hooks and, and the quirky sounds work so well together. So, yeah, they're an influence, although um, you probably can't tell because my music's not really up to their level, but it is quirkier. The only thing that I think you might not expect is what hasn't influenced me, which would be progressive rock like prog rock and uh, the berlin school genres as nice as they are i don't listen to them that much and they don't really influence me as far as i'm aware i like the technology of that era i like the you know the Moog modular and the mellotron i like those instruments but i think i use them in a fairly different way so i don't know I think other people would have to tell me if that's influenced me or not. But up until watching Bandersnatch, I think I, I really haven't listened to it all that much. <laughs> yeah, in terms of, there's lots of other artists that I, I listen to a lot and have influenced me like for various periods. Uh, yeah, Left Feels Leftism, uh, Underworld. Uh, there's a good few tracks of mine where it's like, oh, that's basically Underworld style. Um, yeah, I was listening to them very heavily a while back. Uh, Dubno Bass with My Headman is a fantastic album. It's one of those that I think I got because it was in a sale originally, but then it really grew on me. But then you have to wonder how much of your taste in music is just arbitrary and it's just how much you listen to it versus how good it is. But I'm pretty sure that things like um, Left Field's Leftism and Underworld's Dubbing the Bass of My Head Man, these are kind of classic albums, uh, Future Sound of London's Life Forms, uh, although it really could just be repetition, I don't know. Um, oh, old school house music, old school techno music. I'm getting into like the golden age of hip hop lately. Um, oh yeah, if you listen to the house song Promised Lands, that I think is the main influence of Hand in Hand, and you really should uh, you know check it out if you haven't already because it's a it's a classic uh, song, one of my favourites. So yeah, that's a good one. That's all for me, I think. Goodbye. Thank you, there's some really good questions, I like that. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did and uh, feel free to send me some more for the next time. Thank you.